In the muscle and strength world, a deload refers to a period of training, usually just a week, where you shift your focus away from intense progressive workouts and toward recovery, factors like rest, sleep, and proper nutrition. Most people still train during a deload, it's just that the training is modified so that recovery can be leveraged to increase gains over the long term. And I actually don't think enough people leverage recovery effectively. It seems that most bodybuilders are so hung up on the go hard or go home mentality that they forget that the gains actually happen when you go home and rest. And this hardcore mindset often results in these long and grueling plateaus, especially when trainees mistakenly assume that the best way to break through a plateau is to work even harder, when in reality, the antidote is to actually work smarter, not harder. Just think about it. In every other sport on the planet, athletes and coaches realize that you need to have periods of rest and lighter training in order to optimize performance over the long haul. Bodybuilding and strength sports shouldn't be an exception. This is because of something called the two compartment fitness fatigue model. This model tells us that anytime we train, we increase both fitness and fatigue. Fitness is the good stuff, muscle, strength, etc., And fatigue is the bad stuff, metabolic waste, muscle damage, nervous system fatigue, and so on. And if fitness and fatigue are both high, performance will suffer. This is why if you max out on Monday and then go back and max out again on Tuesday, 99% of the time, you'll be weaker on Tuesday. Obviously, Monday's workout didn't make you somehow lose your gains. It's just that the fatigue you created is temporarily masking your improvement in fitness. Once that fatigue dissipates, you'll see the gains you made and can keep pushing forward. And this is where the deload comes in. A properly timed deload allows your body to flush out the fatigue so that overall performance can be maximized. And since performance is ultimately what drives both strength and size, I think deloads can be a useful tool for both powerlifters and bodybuilders. So let's start with the three different types of deloads so you can figure out which one will work best for you and your goals. First, there's the full week off. A lot of old school bodybuilders did this in the off season, but it's fallen out of popularity a bit lately as most people now realize that active rest is generally better than doing nothing at all. And even though research does show that most people won't lose significant size or strength until at least two to three weeks of no training, I don't often recommend this type of deload these days simply because it can throw off your momentum. I personally find that if I take a full week off, the weights will feel super heavy in that first week back, whereas if I still train, but with a modified approach that we'll get to, I actually end up feeling even stronger on that first week back. The full week off can still have its place though. For example, if you're on a vacation and don't have gym access, taking a week off definitely won't kill your gains and there's nothing wrong with taking a mental break every once in a while as well. Okay, the second type of deload is the taper week, and this is the one that I use all the time with power lifters. In fact, my latest power building phase three program is essentially a strength peaking plan, and it ends with a taper week before a max test. Here, you wanna drop volume way back while still maintaining a high intensity. So in a taper week, you're still training heavy, you just do roughly half the sets and cut back on the so-called accessory lifts. So for example, let's say you wanna test your squat max in week 10 here. You could set up a taper so that in week eight, you're still doing eight weekly sets for the squat and still doing squat accessory work. But then in week nine, you taper the squat work back to four weekly sets and slash the accessory stuff while keeping the loads relatively heavy. Then you'll be primed for your best possible max the following week. Of course, the taper isn't always appropriate for bodybuilders because they usually aren't trying to peak for a one rep max specifically. So this brings me to the third type of deload, which I'm just calling the standard deload. In this case, you wanna more moderately decrease both volume and intensity. So I'll usually drop volume back by 30 to 50%. In practice, that amounts to slashing one or two sets per movement. So if I'm normally doing three to four sets per exercise on the deload week, I'll do two to three sets per exercise. And I'll also drop the intensity back, but not by much. For example, if I'm normally training at an RPE of eight to 10, in the deload week, I'll train at an RPE of six to eight. Now, if you train more instinctively and don't micromanage your numbers like this, that's perfectly fine. You can simply think of your deload week as a light week where you stay a few reps further from failure and do one less set per exercise. That should do the trick to flatten fatigue without having to think too hard about it. And either way, I think it's smart to not think of your deload as an excuse to sandbag your workouts, but rather to think of it as an opportunity to focus your attention on technique and mind-muscle connection. Some coaches have actually started calling their deloads technique weeks, so people know that they're not a step backwards, just a temporary shift in focus. The lighter loads will help you refine your setup and execution, and the reduction in volume will help you really hone in on the sets that you are doing by actively stretching and squeezing the target muscle. Okay, so how often should you deload? 
Well, there are two main approaches to this, depending on who you ask. Some coaches prefer to schedule deloads proactively, usually once every four to eight weeks. Generally speaking, the more advanced you are, the more often you'll want to deload because you need to train harder to make progress, meaning you'll generate more fatigue than someone who's less advanced. Other coaches prefer to schedule deloads reactively, meaning you'll only deload when you feel like you actually need one. This is more of an auto-regulated approach where if you feel like you're making great progress and your motivation is high, what's the point of potentially slowing that down just because you're supposed to deload? And while I do get the reasoning behind this, for me, the biggest downside of the reactive approach is that even if you have great lifter's intuition, it's actually really hard to tell when you need a deload. Not all soft tissues and tendons are well innervated with nerves, meaning you could be accumulating joint stress without even realizing it. Everything's going great, and then all of a sudden, you tweak something unexpectedly. So I do generally prefer to schedule deloads proactively ahead of time, unless I'm dealing with a very mature lifter who knows their body extremely well. Now, with all of that said, I think there are some lifters who probably don't need to worry about deloads at all. First, early beginners. In your first year of training, you shouldn't be generating enough fatigue to really need a formal deload. As a beginner, you can make amazing progress by just learning proper technique and figuring out what it actually means to train hard. Once you get to the late beginner to early intermediate stage, usually that's after one or two years of lifting, including a deload makes a lot more sense. The other exception would be what I'm gonna call lazy lifters. And this is a pretty broad category of people who are also not generating enough fatigue to warrant a deload. You're already deloading every week. You don't need another one. In this case, regardless of your training age, I'd say to focus on getting more diligent with your training first, then start planning deloads once you lock in the proper planning. But with those exceptions aside, I do think that once you hit the intermediate stage, deloads can be one of the single best strategies for busting plateaus and driving progress forward. And before we go, I wanna thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is a massive online learning community that offers thousands of classes on creative topics like animation, writing, video editing, music, web development, and even business stuff like marketing and productivity. One question I get asked all the time is how I edit my videos. And sometimes people are surprised to hear that for the last several years, I've done all the editing on this channel myself. I think a lot of people who do creative work or want to have a creative career are a little too eager to outsource things rather than learning the skills for themselves. I think that having that knowledge yourself is what gives you the most power as a content creator. And Skillshare is easily the best resource for this type of learning, whether you're just starting out or you're looking to elevate your craft to the next level. For example, this course on filmmaking for content creators will teach you how to make all sorts of video from travel vlogs to product reviews and even short form stuff like TikTok and Instagram reels. This is a beginner level course, so once you've mastered these basics, you can easily find more advanced classes as you specialize your skill set. So the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the first link in the description box below will get a free one month trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. Skillshare's classes are taught by fellow creatives who are also practicing what they preach. So the information is always to the point and up to date. So make sure you're one of the first 1,000 people and get a head start on that skill that you're looking to master. So thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring the video. I really do appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys all here in the next one.